Okay, this is um, the second of the three examples in which I will show you how to use Galapagos and genetic algorithms to augment your tool um, and to solve or to create new possibilities. Um, again, while showing you this, I'll try to emphasize the fact that this genetic algorithm process can be used dangerously to give you answers. Um, and I would encourage you to try to find ways in which you can use it to uh, create new possibilities or give you options. Um, so um, this uh, example, just to give you a little sneak peek, um, is a way to um, modify, say, the location of public spaces or plazas um, on a building site. And a building site being divided up into these blocks with these uh, lines are then going to have a series of public sites on top of it. And the question in this task in, in here that we're going to solve for is how to create a series of public sites that either can see each other um, or are all, all grouped together so that when you're standing on a public site um, you can see as many other public sites as possible. Um, a little sneak peek. Uh, if I try to solve it, um, then <coughs> while iterating through all these possibilities and trying to find and maximize uh, sites that can see each other um, you'll get an example like this. So now <clears throat> a little time has passed and you can see that um, the highest most value has gone up really sharply over here. This is the average moving upwards. This is the lowest half, upper half. And um, if we stop our solver and see what the ideal version is, um, this is a kind of example in which you have as many pink lines as possible. Um, I think that's what I'm solving for in this version. Um, and so you can see that you have these plazas um, in which uh, in which uh, these lines are as connected as possible, so they're visible. And you can already see that you know if you were standing here, you'd be able to see these other plazas of buildings. So this is kind of an example of an, uh, a spatial implication of what Galapagos can do. And I'm going to do that uh, <coughs> and try to solve, uh, create this from scratch and try to solve this problem right now. Um, so I'm going to start a new version, um, but I'm just going to keep interface that lets me uh, work, sync the two viewports. You've seen this many times before. And I'm going to then run through this a little bit quickly because some of this you may have seen. Um, but again, the most important aspect is I set up a, a tool, um, then I use Grasshopper. I set up a tool and do a data analysis, and then I used Grasshopper to modify everything based on the data analysis. So really, the, the process of setting up uh, geometry, analyzing it, representing it, the analysis is really important um, in this part. Um, and that's really a large chunk of uh, the, the genetic algorithm optimization process. How do you measure what you want? Um, so I'm going to First of all, using the geometry pipeline, grab both the plaza site and the division lines. This is the site, these are the lines. I'm going to grab the lines. So um, this is so I can draw my own lines and create geometry. Um, for the time being, I am going to work in just this one view. So what I want to do is I want to get the site and I want to use I'm going to use a surface split function. I can give it a surface and even since it's a closed polyline it treats it as a surface. I'm going to cut it with these lines and so as a result I get six trimmed surfaces. Um, and then I'm going to get these surfaces and I'm going to uh, get the, let's see, I'm going to offset them. So in order to offset um, the surface split, I will take the surface and I want to get the outer boundaries of the surface. I can do this a few ways, but I'm going to use uh, BREP edges. And I'm going to grab the naked edge curves. Um, now if you look at the curves, you'll see that uh, they've also exploded them in the process. I don't want that, so I'm going to join the curves. 
um, within each branch. So that will give me six curves again, um, which are representative of these six things. And then now I'm going to take these curves, and since we have these uh, six curves, we're going to flatten them back into a, a single list. Um, because I don't need to branch them anymore, or keep the branches. And I'm going to offset all these curves. Um, okay. And as for the distance, I'm going to say 1.2, negative, and I'll try that out. Now this is great, except that this is expanding for some reason. Um, and it may be that the direction of uh, this initial geometry is um, flipped, or the normals are different. Let's try, sometimes uh, it's helpful to use deconstruct brep and then grab the edges, and then do the same thing in which you use join, and you can see the problem has been solved here. Um, I could go in and debug that, but uh, well, it works, and uh, sometimes getting the brep edges is cleaner, so um, uh, let's go ahead with that now. So this is great. Now I have these uh, offset curves. And you can see the reason why I'm doing this is so I can kind of have blocks, so to speak. Um, if I add another division line like that, I get a block division divided into pieces as such. Um, and since, actually, if you think about it, from this line, it's being offset 1.4 units this way, 1.4 units that way. I could divide this by 2, this number by 2 and use it to drive the offset. So 1.4 would be the thickness of the roads. And just to continue using the remote control panel, I'm going to expose it and call it road thickness. So if I change the road thickness, you can see that changes also. That's great. OK, so now we have our geometry. And now we want to know uh, how to create plazas. Um, and so we have our offset geometry. And I'm actually going to uh, flatten this list also, since uh, we don't ha really have a tree structure. Each of these curves is a discrete thing. Now, the question of creating plazas. And before I'm going to do that, um, I'm going to make this look, uh, kind of continue the fulfill the example that I showed and make these kind of triangular uh, building points. Um, this is kind of ancillary or uh, less relevant to um, this uh, this tutorial, so if you want to skip this part, um, you should click on the, the link that's showing up right now. So I'm actually going to use a cluster for this, just to remind you what a cluster is. Um, it's a way to encapsulate uh, what's going on um, into a lot of stuff into a single component. Um, and this is especially nice to use a cluster because it's a, a, a part of the Grasshopper uh, workflow that takes input, takes as input um, some geometry and gives some other piece of geometry. Um, and it's relatively black box, which is to say you only give uh, this component or, the, uh, or, um, or this process an input and it gives you an output. Um, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to hide everything so that I just have this, and I'm going to notice if I'm going to uh, create a cluster by uh, right-clicking on this geometry item. So now I have one input, one output. I'm going to double-click in and operate in here. Um, that's why it's helpful to use clusters because I can kind of have a new playing field. I'm not thinking about anything else. All I know is that I have these input curves. And I want to create some geometry. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the centroid, which I get via the area component of each object, and I'm going to move the centroid upwards a given amount. Oops. I'm going to move the centroid upwards a given amount. Um, now we're going to change this in a little bit, but uh, let's just start out with this first. And then what I want to do is I want to connect, uh, wh what I could do is I could extrude the geometry upwards, but we won't, don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to create um, that point, and from that point I want to uh, create that kind of geometry 
Um, I'm just kind of sketching. Uh, so to create these pyramids. Um, so what I'm going to do is if thinking about the process, and I'm actually going to draw here, is that uh, if you have a singular point, and if you have a bunch of other points here, I'm going to want to grab the first uh, one point on here, the point after this, and top point. And the second point, and the third point, and the top point, and make a triangle. And grab the third point and the fourth point, and make a triangle. And grab the fourth point, or the last point, and the first point, and make a triangle. Um, so what I need to do is then get the first and second point, second and third point, third and fourth point, fourth and first point, and then make those pairs, and then connect it with the top point at all times. So let's try that out. How do I do that? Now these are a series of top points. And these are, and we need the bottommost points. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, and this is good practice whenever you work and you're developing them something new, I'm going to simplify these lines so this is the simplest possible. I'm only going to do it with two uh, pieces of geometry. You know, I'll start out from there and then I'll let it get more complex because, and it's always helpful to start things out in a simple form. So, I if I, if we look at what input we're getting, we're getting these polyline curves. I'm going to get the control points. Um, of these curves, which is great. Um, and if I look at that, look at that. Um, now, the one downside that the control points thing gives us is it actually duplicates uh, our points. Um, this is a little bit annoying. I'm not sure why they didn't include an option to not do that. Um, but you can see because it's a closed curve, it comes back again and duplicates that point. Um, we don't really want that, so I'm going to use the set create set component. Um, what this does, it's really a mathematical function that creates a bunch of unique numbers, but since it preserves the order and removes duplicates, it has the effect of removing that last thing. So now we get the five unique uh, control points in it. And so what we want to do is we want to have these pairs of the first and second point, second and third point, third and fourth, fourth point. The way we can do is we can use the Com uh, command shift list, which offsets all items in a list. So I have an input, this is a lift to sh list to shift, the shift os offset sh shift by one, and this key component wrap the values. So if you're shifting the fifth um, object in a list, I'll shift to the first. So if we plug this in, now it looks like we've done it by Okay, great. So it looks like it's shifted the list. The only way we can compare it is by looking at the unshifted list. So I'm going to place them next to each other. So you can see it's 29, 27, 11, 12. We've started with 27, 11, 12, 31, 29. Um, it's actually kind of shifted it backwards. So maybe if we rearrange the order, we're getting 27, 29. Nope, that's not right. Okay, 29, 27, 27, 11, 11, 12, 12, 31, 31, 29. So you can see there's this kind of a... Um, circular pairing of the first and second point, second and third point, um, that kind of thing. So now we want to get these two numbers, or these two sets of data. I'm just going to connect them like this so that's easier to understand. So, and I also want to use um, at each point uh, this top point. Um, and I'm going to simplify both of these things. I'm going to plug them into these panels respectively. So notice that um, all of these first five points are on branch 0 and all of these second five points are on branch 1. So I'm going to use the graft component and the simplified component to do the same thing just so that this first center point is on branch 0. So if I plug, if I uh, move this over here, then um, what's going to happen is that uh, if I do c use a component that uses the input of all three things, it's going to use this point, that point, and this point. And then this point, 27.4, 11.12, and 23.06. Now, I'm going to use surface point, four point surface, but you can also use three points here. So it's going to use um, these three points. And you see that I've already had it happening right here. Um, 
So that's great. Uh, and if I got the output of that, I get a bunch of trim surfaces. Now I can change the height of this thing. But let's actually say um, there's a given FAR, or there's some sort of rule I want to uh, kind of keep. So the larger the space, um, the lower the building. So I, since I also have the area of each site, um, well, let's first of all let's say that actually uh, the larger the site, the taller the building. Um, so I'm going to divide the area by an arbitrary number. Um, let's say I divide it by a hundred. I'm going to use this as uh, the z value to move um, the center dots. So you can see that the larger uh, volume is taller, depending on if I divide it less, it goes like that. Um, and um, so that's fun. And I'm also then going to, I have all these trim surfaces. I'm going to join the B reps together. So I got these poly surfaces. And then I'm actually going to cap the holes because there's a hole on the bottom of each one. So now they're like solid objects. They're closed B-Rep. And then I'm going to flatten them again, partially because I came in with flattened geometry. So I came in with two uh, two polyline curves, and I leave with two B-Reps. And then I'm going to use the cluster output function. So now I'm going to click on this, make sure to choose save and close. And great, I have an output and this thing. Now why do I have two outputs? It's because somewhere in here I have this other output. I'm going to delete that. If I click on save, I get another output. So now what goes in? Let's say that we'll call this pyramid maker. What goes in? A uh, lot line. What comes out? A pyramid or a form. So this means I can kind of divide this uh, lot. And I, um, each side I divide gets turned into these you know, pyramidical forms. I can use interpolated curve to do the same thing. This is kind of fun. Now let's say these are too shallow. So I really want to uh, modify this and see why is this complaining. Curve must be closed. So it looks like at some points when we may not actually be getting a closed curve. Um, but it doesn't seem like there are any errors here. So let's deal. See, that's okay for now. Um, and let's say I actually want to control this from the outside. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double click, type input, and connect that into this item so that I can attach a slider here connect the height of the pyramids from the outside world. Let's say this for now. This is uh, pretty helpful and interesting. And now if you get an interpolated curve because you get a series of control points, you get um, these very uh, smooth or multifaceted surfaces. Okay, that's pretty fun. Um, but uh, I'm going to deal with that for the time being. So now um, we have our forms, and I'm going to stop here for a second to modify how these are being uh, represented. I'm going to use a swatch component to define a color of some sort and make it a little transparent so we can see through it. I'm going to hide everything ex except for the preview function. So great, this is how it looks. I still have the magic of being able to draw lines and have it define blocks. And this is still pretty fun, and I can still kind of change the road thickness. Zero. Okay, so now the question is how do we define the plazas? Again, um, I'm going to define the plazas, and if you want to skip over this part, click the link that appears. Um, but um, I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going, I'm going to grab the lot line, put a point on it, Let's say um, create a sphere around it and define that as a plaza. Let's try that out. Um, so I have these lot lines, uh, and you know sometimes it's helpful, really helpful, to get into the habit of naming everything. And so I'm going to get a point on the surface. Now, what I'm going to how that, I'm going to do that by uh, oh sorry, I'm going to get a point on the lot line. Um, I will do that by 
Um, I could use the point on curve function, and I, just to illustrate what I'm talking about, uh, it's that I'm going to grab one of these points and then create you know, some sort of plaza around it of some sort. Um, but I'm going to use a component that um, depend I can give input a 0 to 1 and it gives me a point on that curve. So um, it's evaluate length. So what I'm going to do is I give it an input, I give it a length, and in this case it's normalized, so I'm getting, giving it a number from 0 to 1. And I'm going to use many decimal points because uh, the more decimal points, uh, the more accurate I can be. So you can see that, um, whoops, 0 to 1. As I move the slider, the slider changes, the location of the point changes. Um, now, I'm going to hide this for the time being, the pyramid. Now, I, uh, I have these points, and I'm going to create circles around them of a given radius, not too big. Um, and I'm going to subtract the circle from its respective lot line. So I'm do going to do region difference. So I say subtract B from A. So now I get these lot lines. And you can see that as I move these dots around, the lot lines change. Um, now, obviously, this is dealing with a circular lot. There are you know, a few other ways I can divide the lot. Um, but this is a pretty good shorthand um, for the time being. So let's stick with this for now. Um, and in fact, instead of using a circle, just f because it's fun, I'm going to use a polyline instead, a polygon. I'm going to plug it into difference over here. Um, and so now I get these kind of polygonal voids or public spaces moving around. That's great, hexagonal shapes. Um, so these are now my new regions. And now I can plug this into the pyramid maker. And so then if I turn the preview back on, then you can see that uh, depending on how the lot lines change, my pyramidal forms change as well. And it's very satisfying. This is great. So now I have these lot lines and these objects and now these uh, public areas. So now this is great. And so um, this is now when Galapagos steps in a little bit. Um, so what do I want? Well, let's say I want to have all the public spaces be able to see each other. Um, well, what does that really mean? And how do you calculate that? So let's say this is public space and they grab it from the middle of the public space to the middle of this public space. Can they s oops, I'm going to use a different layer so that Grasshopper, Rhino doesn't get mixed up. Um, can they see each other? Well, they can because there's a building in the way. How can you calculate that? Well, you can calculate that by testing whether or not this line crosses the lot line boundary of this building. Whenever it does, it's because it's crossing the lot line, you could say that it's crossing through the building as well, and thus um, the line of sight is being interrupted. But in this case, um, these are our streets, so ignore these purple lines. It's not crossing over any, uh, any of the lot line of the building. So in this case, we have a pure line of sight. So then our task is, um, one thing we could do is we could draw all those lines of sights between all of the public spaces and then figure out if any of them intersect with the building lot line and then find out the ones that do not intersect and count how many they are. So I'm going to do the same thing um, and work with simple forms, simplified forms. Um, let's Actually, this is pretty simple enough. Um, and so let's try to implement that um, process now. So we have the new lot lines, and I'll call these the new lot lines. New lot lines. Now, I also want to get the center of the public spaces, and the center of those public spaces are uh, these points. So I'm going to use the point and call it 
um, or plaza, plaza point. So these are the plaza points. Then I want to get all the connections between points. Now, how do I do that? One way of doing it is to use um, the cross-reference. So you're cross-referencing data from multiple lists. Um, and you can plug it into both and use the lower triangle component to be able to cross-reference these two lists together. Now, what is this really doing? Really quick, very, 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 very quick detour. Um, cross-reference um, is like saying, let's say you have uh, four pieces of geometry and items, and you wanted to connect it um, with itself. Um, it's con going to connect A to B, A to C, A to D, B to A, B to C, B to D, or actually no, it's not going to connect B to A, apologies. It's going to connect A to B, A to C, A to D, B to C, B to D, and C to D. Um, that's what lower triangle strict does. Now the reason why it's triangle is because um, if you have a matrix with A to B, A to Z, or your number of parameters on the top and number of parameters on the left, um, the list of connections kind of looks like a triangle. I can explain this to you if you're more interested, but suffice to say that um, using strict means that you're, no, you're not going to connect um, A to uh, an object to it, itself. Um, so suffice to say that um, this is a way to uh, create all the links between line uh, points. So if I use the line component and I plug uh, these as inputs, you can see I'm getting all the connections between all the points. How do we verify this? Well, let's say there are um, four plazas. You get six connections. You get six connections over here. Um, so now we are getting all the line or the plaza line of sight visi uh, visibilities between plazas. Now we want to know: Do they interfere with any of the lot lines? Do they cross? Well, they must. So which ones don't? So what I'm going to use: I'm going to use the intersect, and I'm going to use a physical intersection between a curve and a curve. Now make sure that you don't use the mathematical intersection between a curve and a line, because the line it's using in this case is an infinite line. So if I have a line here using the mathematical intersection, it'll think that this curve intersects these lines because as a mathematical line, this line goes on forever and intersects these two curves. But the physical curve, physical intersection um, series um, don't uh, do that. They only look at the specific physical curve and realize that, no, this line does not intersect these two curves. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to plug in the lines here and then plug in the lines here. Um, and actually, I'm going to do it the other way around for reasons I'll explain in a second. And then let's see how many uh, points we get. We probably don't get any. Now, the reason why is because um, because these are two lists, it's just going to compare the first six items on the, on the list with the first six items on the curve. But that's not what we want. We want to kind of uh, uh, use each curve and compare it against all of the lot lines. So we're going to graph this set. As a result, we get all these intersection lines which is great. Um, okay, so we get all these intersection points, and those points can be represented here. Um, and I'm going to simplify this. And because I we've grafted uh, the line, um, it's organized. I'm going to use the pram viewer. It's organized into many branches, but the root branches, it's organized into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 14 branches, or actually 15 branches, which is the number of uh, lines we have in the first place. So the first um, branch and the second sub-branch, so it's on 0th branch, second and the 0th sub-branch, 0th branch is the first sub-branch. So this means that um, the 0th line, the 0th line of sight, um, intersected at two points with uh, the first or n number one or the second um, sub branch or the second lot line twice at two points. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use the shift paths because I don't really care which one it intersected. I just care what it intersected with. So I'm going to using the shift paths, and what shift paths does is it 
consolidates everything within a sub branch just under that branch. So you can see it becomes vastly simplified. So if I plug it in here, you can see I only have 15 branches and then you have items underneath it. Um, what I'm interested in is not what it intersected in, but whether it intersected or not in the first place. Does it have an intersection? Um, I can do this a few different ways. Um, one way I'm going to do is, you can notice that this item, one, doesn't have any object. It's just null. So what I can do is I can say test the data item for null. So if I plug this in, and this is true or false, it will give me a list of um, true or false values. It's kind of not what we want, and we can use, well, okay, so we can use, I'm just going to finish this explanation, so we can say, okay, this is great, and you can notice that um, the true points are locations where it did not intersect, um, and the false points are locations where it did intersect, but there's also probably a better way to get this information. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the length of the tree, uh, sorry, the length of the list. So if I grab the length of the list, this has two items in that list, this has zero items in the list. This has two items in the list, zero items in the list, two, zero, two, zero. So only when this result is zero does it mean that it has not intersected with any of the lot lines. So I'm going to flatten this out. Then I can say, okay, when is it zero? Um, I can say, well, it's only zero here, 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 and here. So then I can use the dispatch command. I'll plug that pattern into my pattern, and I'll plug get our lines over here, and then it, it'll sort using the dispatch command will sort the lines based on this true/false pattern. So if I just grab just the trues, I can see these are the lines that I'm going to click on the uh, new lot lines. These are the lines that did not intersect with any of the other lots. Um, that looks right. It looks great. Um, and so the question is, well, how long are those lines? Or how many are there? We have five lines. So I can use the list length component again. So now this tells us, great, we have five lines in which the lot lines are the most visible. Or, or sorry, we have five lines in which the plazas were visible to each other. And that's great. Um, I'm going to clean this up a little bit, um, just in terms of aesthetics or representation. So I'm going to basically hide everything except for the preview component. Um, I am also going to use the preview component, custom preview component, to show the lines of visibility, let's say, in a very sharp color. And also to show the lines of non-visibility in perhaps a dimmer color, a more transparent or lighter color. Um, so you can see already that these lines um, were not uh, are, are lines of sight that are visible. And so then if I go back and move around the public spaces you can see that the red lines modify and change themselves. So in this point of view most of them can see each other. Now I actually want to move these points independently and not use this, uh, this single slider. Um, so how do I do that? Well, I could uh, use multiple different sliders and plug them into each into these, you know, so that uh, this one only controls one of them. But that would be a little annoying. What I'm going to use actually is the gene pool component. It's a, actually a component in Galapagos, but it's a series of sliders, um, and I'm going to set them from zero to one. And there are a series of sliders um, that I can control. In um, independently. This is really helpful because it's just a series of sliders and then I can cl plug it into the length component. Now the problem with this is that if I have uh, 10 sliders I get 10 points even though I have 6 slot lines. So I'm going to use the short list component to uh, match the length of these things. So this way I have 
unless that is the appropriate length. So I can control each. Uh, oops. I can control each location of the site independently. That's great. Um, and then at the end, we want to want to see this number, and that's the number. This is our fitness function. Um, so that's pretty great. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, try to uh, use uh, the representation and filter um, presentation view. Filter what geometry shows up where. So you know while the uh, the um, geometry of the building shows up on the right-hand side. I'm going to use um, the left-hand side to display our new lot lines, among other things. You see on the left you see the lot lines, on the right-hand side you see the buildings. Let's also let us see the points of the plazas. Okay, great. Um, so, now we can use Galapagos, um, and we're going to do so. Let's use something of this radius. Excellent. So, Galapagos. Now, what are we controlling? What is our genome? Our genome is this number, and we're going to plug it into here. Now you may ask, um, if we only have six lot lines, why are we controlling ten genes? That's a very good question. Um, part of the reason why is because I've set this up as a tool, so if I use another polyline to cut through uh, the site, I'm going to change the layer, try again, then I result in a series of lot lines. I get ten lot lines, and so then ten polyline curves, and then I thus still need ten genes to drive them. Um, that's why I'm using shortest list. And so by uh, controlling more genomes than are necessary, I can make sure that I'm accommodating for uh, more lot lines should I want to make more um, with new lines. But for the time being, I'm just going to experiment with this version. And so that's my genome. The fitness, again, that's over here. It's the number of uh, free sight lines, or good sight lines that exist uh, amongst uh, the buildings. I'm going to plug into the fitness function. And I'm also just going to look at the representation or view. Whoops. And I'm going to double click on Galapagos and run it. And I want that number to be as large as possible. So I'm going to start the solver. And I'm going to click on this button. And it starts to iterate amongst all the different possibilities. Um, so again, as it's doing, you can see the red, red lines is trying to maximize that number. Um, just by increasing the number of sight lines, I have uh, tried to make the spaces look at each other as much as possible. Now, what this looks like, it looks like this. We'll skip ahead. So after about five minutes, um, we've arrived at this, and you can see that um, this is kind of a list of chromosomes. These are the list of the uh, values, um, the slider values, so 0 to 1, 0 to 1 vertically. Um, and you can see this is kind of different clumps of populations, but um, you can see we've kind of arrived at an answer, so I'm going to stop the solver and reinstate the best possibility. Uh, let see, stop the solver, reinstate the best possible version. So we've gotten uh, this result, um, which is pretty good uh, so far. Um, you can see that, um, in fact, it's perfect. We have all plazas with all of them connected together. Um, I suppose to an extent, you know, this is kind of predictable. Um, you can also do something in which you might say you never want the plazas to see each other, or you want half of them to see each other. Um, or something like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, you could imagine that, and we can try really quickly uh, what happens if you have them never see each other. Um, so, um, I'm going to minimize that number and try all the different possibilities. Um, have it run through them. 
um, have them have the red lines be as minimal as possible and about in five minutes now you can see um, a result so we're going to stop the solver this is after another five minutes reinstate so a little bit as expected now we have an example in all the plazas never look at each other um, so when you were in, you'd be in one plaza you'd never have line of sight with another one um, so that's um, one example in which you can use a constrained plaza. Now we can use uh, the fitness function. Right now we've only have we only have the number of connections, but um, you can do certain things. Like you could say, okay, I want them all to look at each other, but I do never want any of them to overlap as much as possible. Well, how do we do such a thing? Um, one way that we could, and I'm going to. If you click on the gene pool and you can click right click and click randomize, I'll kind of randomize them around and I just want to find an example and try to create a version in which, okay, the polygons do overlap. In this case, great, there's a great deal of overlap. Um, now, yeah, let's say you want to have them never overlap. Uh, in this case, they do. So one way you can do that is you can find the overlaps between all the polygons. Um, how do we do that? Well, we can do the similar thing we did with a cross-reference. Cross you can grab the new lot lines. Um, I'm going to bring that down over here. And then I'm going to do the region intersection. Um, that's one possibility. This may be a little slow. Oh, and as a result, we... Oh. I don't want to actually get the lot lines, I want to do a region intersection on the polygons, in fact. So as a result, it looks like we actually don't get any um, intersections. Um, sometimes intersections region, um, are actually not that uh, effective. Another way we can do this is on a mathematical level. Um, if if you imagine that all of the polygons overlapped, then um, you well what we can do is we can get the region union of all the polygons, so we get this outer boundary. And if all the polygons are different or are not overlapping, then the area of region union is going to equal the area of all the individual polygons. But if the polygons all overlap, let's imagine they all perfectly overlap, then the region union is going to equal the size of one polygon, but the area of all the individual ones, polygons, is going to be six times the size of the region union. So one of the ways we can figure out how, um, whether or not uh, the geometry overlaps is through math. So we say, okay, well, um, you can get the... Uh, number of polygons so we have six polygons and if we get the region union and get the area that's our total area and we're going to add the area all together and we're going to divide it by the number of polygons we have so that should give us um, per each polygon on average how the area that each polygon is taking up um, according to the combined um, overlapping space. But in reality, each polygon on average, and I'm going to get the average here, taking up 93. So um, if the, num the smaller the number gets in relationship to this, uh, the more the overlap is. And if they're identical, then there's fewer overlap. So actually what I can do is I can divide one by the other. Um, and so if these are identical, overlap is going to be 1, full overlap is going to be 0, and uh, full non-overlap is going to be 1. So this is a way of measuring overlap. Um, now, um, as an example, so this is like our overlap fitness. Let's try to run the uh, generic algorithm and try to have the plazas overlap as much as possible. So I'm going to take the fitness function, plug it into here. I'll double clip. 
since I want them to overlap as much as possible, um, I want to minimize that since I said uh, 1 was least overlap, 0 is most overlap. So I'm going to minimize it. Oh, and I'm going to stop the solver and uncheck this box so I can see what's going on. I'm going to start the solver again, minimize that number, and I'm going to start. So then it's going to iterate through all the possibilities, and then it's going to try to overlap the public spaces as much as possible. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to about five minutes after uh, five minutes into the future and let it run for five minutes. So as a result, um, you can see that uh, processes after five minutes has uh, kind of arrived as a result. If we reinstate the most recent ideal form, you can see that uh, we've created a scenario in which there is as much overlap in amongst the public spaces as possible. So this is pretty interesting um, as a whole, and uh, you can find uh, and realize that depending on what value or what kind of end goal you have, you can and if you can turn that uh, architectural goal or thesis into a number of some sort that somehow represents a measure or a metric of how to measure these things, then you can use uh, Galapagos to then solve these um, problems um, and to help you attain part of your workflow in conjunction um, with this tool. Um, another way to combine multiple metrics um, or multiple values is to say, well, you know, I like the idea of spaces being able to see each other, but I don't want them to overlap as much as possible. So in fact, I don't want any overlap, um, but I do want them to be able to see each other. Um, so uh, that's one case in which we want to maximize the number of these red lines, but we want to minimize the overlap as much as possible. So much in the same way that in the volume vase, and we wanted larger, larger volume and smaller surface, we divided by the volume by the surface, we're going to do a similar thing here. Um, so if the overlap um, goes to zero, uh, that means you have maximum overlap. Um, so the more of an overlap, the smaller this number gets. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the f this fitness function of uh, the um, the number of lines of visibility, these red lines, by the number of overlap. Um, now think about that for a second. This, if the number of sight lines is the same, let's say five, but the overlap is zero overlap, there's zero overlap, or there's no overlap, then this number is going to be one. So multi by multiplying those two together, numbers together, I get five. But if I start to have more and more overlap, um, this overlap number might decrease to 0 0.5. So then this number, resulting number, will become 2.5. So this multiplication right here is a way to uh, maximize fitness function and to maximize this overlap metric, which um, it's a little counterintuitive, but which is to say to minimize the overlap. Maximizing this overlap metric is minimizing the overlap. Um, again, just because uh, uh, we've done the calculation that way. So I'm then instead going to use this number, the fitness function. Um, and so this is the way I'm combining factors. I'm going to say, well, listen, I want to have as many lines of sight as possible while minimizing the overlap as much as possible. So I'm going to try this again. Um, and using Galapagos, I'm going to uh, again run uh, run this process. And let's see what we get in about five minutes. Okay, so after five minutes, you can see it's almost working. Now we have an interesting phenomenon here. Um, we actually get zero, um, and what that means is that here uh, you, we're getting um, zero. Uh, we're getting zero because we're we may be at a point where the number of connections um, uh, is zero because we're actually trying to minimize this entire thing. Um, looks like I might have um, clicked minimize instead of maximize so I am going to stop this and try again um, but it's interesting to see what happens if you do minimize um, try and maximize and start this again keep this rolling for the next five minutes okay so looks like um, we've gotten to a pretty good point and now I'm going to stop the solver uh, 
and I'm going to reinstate one of the newest versions. Um, so now you can see uh, it's made almost all of them lines of sight, and it hasn't. It's tried its best not to overlap any of the polygons um, or the public spaces. Um, let's double check by looking at all the polygons and highlighting them. Yeah, so they're you know they're overlapping, but um, it's also trying to balance it out with having as many lines of sight as possible. Um, so now by maximizing that number, we're getting um, kind of these public spaces that don't overlap as much yet uh, maintain lines of sight. Um, so now you get the relationship between that number and that metric and what kind of uh, space you get. Um, and uh, you can imagine that you can do similar things and have other different kind of calculations. You could um, calculate um, public spaces or these um, areas that um, you know are in clumps as possible. You can find if if you uh, if you did the region union um, and then grab the area and grab the standard deviation of the area, for example, um, you could say you could try to have um, the number of clumps of these public spaces be. Um, or you 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 could have the different side have the public spaces of these conjoined plazas to be as disparate as possible. So you can maximize the standard deviation of the joining of the clumps. So maybe you would try to get one small space, a large space, so that you would have different textures of kinds of uh, public spaces or plazas in front of buildings. Um, so you know, or you could. Um, actually measure the standard deviation of these connections and so you could try to have them also be as disparate as possible so you could say okay I want the lines of sight to be varied so I want from a position from standing from a, a plaza to be able to look at as many different uh, pu uh, er, uh, public spaces or plazas as possible that are of different distances to me. Um, so based on that kind of calculation and that kind of metric um, you can end up with drastically different results um, but again, the whole point of this is that you know, using this genetic algorithm solver and using the process of evolution, you and and by doing this process of generating a form and doing a data analysis, in this case the spatial analysis using these lines, and then calculating the number of lines and the relationship to the overlap, etc., then you can find a way to solve for um, a possibility or an answer um, in here. Um, now, it's not. I'm not emphasizing that this is a answer, the answer, but I do want to point out um, that within the process of your tool, um, this kind of solving uh, can be really helpful. And the next example, um, which uh, will kind of deal with the voxelizer uh, and continue with that, um, is one way in which I'm proposing, or it will be, it will be clear uh, about how the genetic algorithm in Galapagos can integrate itself into your workflow as a tool and less as um, a calculator or a machine that gives you an example, uh, a solution.